Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now it seems to me like there's been quite a few CPU releases over the last few months, but not all of them have received much, if any, attention. Like this one, for example. What we have here is the AMD Ryzen 5 5500 GT. Today I want to talk about what it is, why it exists, and whether or not you should buy one. You may be familiar with the Ryzen 5600G, a 6-core 12-thread APU with integrated graphics that launched in 2021. Fast forward a bit and now we have the 5600G, 5600GT and this, the 5500GT, all pretty much occupying the same position in the product hierarchy. They're all very similar. They all have a default 65 watt TDP, 16 megabytes of L3 cache, 6 cores, 12 threads, 1900 megahertz Radeon graphics with 7 CUs and come boxed with a Wraith Stealth cooler. There are slight clock speed variations between them with the original 5600G featuring a 3.9 GHz base clock as opposed to the 5600 GT and 5500 GT's 3.6 GHz. The max boost clocks are 4.4 GHz for the 5500 GT and original 5600G whereas the 5600 GT boosts up to 4.6. Yeah, there's a lot to get your head around here. The 5500 GT is on paper the cheapest with a suggested 125 US dollar retail price, $15 less than the 5600 GT. I'm assuming that these two are intended to replace the original 5600 G. So many G's and GT's going on in this video. Here in the UK, and going by Amazon prices, the 5600G is currently £110, with the 5500GT and 5600GT coming in at £117 and £132 respectively. My advice so far is to get whichever is cheaper. If you don't want integrated graphics, then go for the standard 5600, which is superior to all three, has PCIe 4.0 support and can be found for very similar money. Of course, those looking for an APU are probably intending to put together a low-cost everyday or HTPC system, maybe something capable of some light gaming, as well as something that's not going to consume that much power. On that note, let's see what it can do. To start with, I've tested some games, of course, without a graphics card, starting with Battlefield 5, 1080p here with 70% resolution scaling and the low preset. After testing three Conquest games, I was surprised to see an average of 60 frames per second, with a 1% low of 49 and a 0.1% low of 46, so it was a pretty consistent gaming experience as far as I'm concerned. Counter-Strike 2 at 1080p with the lowest settings. Now this is slightly easier to run for this APU and it's the sort of game that is best suited to it. 80 FPS on average with a 1% low of 64 and a 0.1% low of 45. I definitely consider this playable and I think it's enough to remain somewhat competitive. Unless you're me because... I'm just terrible at this game. Elden Ring up next, and this is going to prove more of a challenge. 1080p with the lowest settings for 31 FPS, a 1% low of 26, and a 0.1% low of 19. This one is probably better suited to lower resolutions, as I don't believe we have an FSR option to choose from, although when I dropped down to 900p, we were only seeing about 3 or 4 frames more. Baldur's Gate 3 next, 1080p with FSR 2.2 set to performance mode with the lowest settings for 38 FPS on average. There were a few problems with the percentile figures but in this game that doesn't seem to matter as much, at least not in my opinion, with a 1% low of 18 here and a 0.1% low of 17. The finals up next, 1080p of course with FSR 2 set to ultra performance and the low preset. Here I was surprised to see 56 FPS with a 1% low of 46 and a 0.1% low of 43. Of course you can choose between FSR and setting a lower native resolution in games that support FSR but I tend to go for FSR because it means that all the on-screen elements such as the HUD remain the same resolution uh, whereas it's just the gameplay that gets a little less sharp and I think upscaling is a bit better than a lower native res but it will depend on the game and it's entirely up to you which one you choose. Fortnite next at the low preset with FXAA enabled and 100% 3D resolution. When you choose the low preset, the 3D res will drop a little bit, but 
I dragged this back up to 100% and we still saw an average of 75 FPS. The 1% low was 47 and the 0.1% low was 25. In Forza Horizon 5, we went with the low preset and TAA here to get rid of some of those jagged edges. And we saw 43 frames per second with a 1% low of 38 and a 0.1% low of 37. So a very consistent gameplay experience. And the game, in my opinion, looks pretty solid with these lower graphical options. No need to go for very low, in my opinion, as it still won't get you 60 FPS, but it can look a lot worse in some areas. GTA 5, an older game and another perfect example of the sort of title you should play on this. Normal settings here with the detail sliders set halfway. Soft shadows were also enabled and FXAA was enabled too. We saw a very nice average of 69 FPS with a 1% low of 56 and a 0.1% low of 55. So again, there is some decent consistency going on here and no dips or drops to speak of. You may be able to squeeze more performance from something like this with overclocking and faster DDR4 RAM, of course. I'm using 16 gigs of 3200 megahertz memory in dual channel. That's two 8 gigabyte sticks. Cyberpunk 2077 up next. This was always going to be more challenging, but even so, we saw 37 FPS, though we did have to enable FSR 2.1 and set it to performance. We could have gone with ultra performance for a slightly higher frame rate, but... If we did that, the game would have looked even blurrier. It's not too bad, actually, at performance mode. 37 FPS, in my opinion, is playable, considering I first played this on the PlayStation 4. So, yeah, anything's playable to me. 24 FPS was that 1% low, and the 0.1% low came in at 18. Finally, we have Red Dead Redemption 2. This also supports FSR 2, and I set this to performance mode, the lowest available option in this game. Textures were set to ultra to avoid everything looking like a muddy mess, but everything else was set to its respective lowest. I did enable TAA, however, and set this to medium for an average of 33 frames per second, a 1% low of 28, and a 0.1% low of 26. So we did see a few drops in and around Valentine, but even so, it was a pretty consistent experience. Adding a discrete GPU into the equation will mean that it runs in PCIe 3.0 mode, which is fine for most cards, but performance may be affected negatively if you use an RX 64 or 6500 XT, both of which have just four PCIe lanes. To be honest though, and I said this before, I don't think this APU makes sense if you plan on using a discrete graphics card right from the get-go. A regular 5600 would make so much more sense. I wanted to test a few games anyway just to show you that this 6-core is still fairly capable capable as a CPU in its own right, though CPU intensive scenes may cause a few dips and drops in some games, particularly the games I decided to run through here. Overall the 5500 GT and 5600 GT for that matter both make very little sense if the original 5600G is still available where you live and costs the same or less. I don't have one for comparison, but I can't imagine it'll be much different when using the iGPU for gaming purposes. The built-in Radeon graphics are getting a bit long in the tooth as well. Perhaps I've just been spoilt by the amazing uplift in performance that the... Still, those with smaller budgets, more basic needs, and a taste for some lightweight gaming titles might find one of these to be ideal. And I'm always happy to see AMD introducing new chips to the AM4 platform all these years years later, even if they don't always make that much sense. But let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.